Hello! So, let's talk about episode three of The Rings of Power. Um, first of all, this was easily the best episode so far. Uh, I liked episodes one and two. I had some uncertainties about whether the story was going to really grip me, whether I was going to like the characters and so forth. Um, I'm now much more confident in saying that I just straight up like this show. I think this is a good show, uh, which is a, which is a relief because that is not what I expected necessarily going into this show based on the fact that it was being made by Amazon, frankly. Um, and based on some decisions that I thought they might be making, but which I now see they aren't necessarily making. Um, so, yeah, I just really like this episode. So if you're here just for like a spoiler-free opinion on the episode, that's my opinion. It was really good. Uh, I, I, I do have some minor complaints, but overall, like, a, a great episode of television. Really, really looking forward to the rest of the season now. Especially because I think I know where some of the storylines are heading, and I think that's going to be really interesting if they handle it right. Uh, so, spoilers for the episode from here on out. Um, let's handle this storyline by storyline. First of all, I really like that the episode chose to focus on just three storylines, um, because as of the end of last episode, we'd kind of split into five separate storylines. We had Galadriel and um, Halbrand over on the ocean. We had uh, Arondir being captured by the orcs. We had Bronwyn and Theo uh, running away from their village. We had um, Elrond and the dwarves, and Durin and Disa, um, and Celebrimbor. And we had the Harfoot. Um, this episode, I think, one of the reasons why this episode is so much stronger in my view than the first two is because it pulled all of that back a bit and focused very, very tightly on just three of those, completely ignoring two of them, which I'm guessing means that the remaining two storylines will be expanded greatly in the next episode. Uh, so the three episodes that we got a heavy focus on here is Arondir's Slavery under the orcs, uh, Galadriel and Halbrand um, coming to Numenor and and sort of everything that goes down in Numenor, and the Harfoots, which is just the same storyline from previous episodes, just continuing into this one. Um, so where do I start? I'm going to leave the Harfoots for the end because I'm going to go on a bit of a wild tangent with that one that not everyone might be interested in uh so i'm going to uh so i'm going to start with some of the some of the other stuff let's start with um with aaron deer's storyline which is a the most straightforward i would say um there are several things here i really like first of all i love the designs of the orcs I love that they seem to be entirely practical effects and costumes rather than CGI, at least as far as I could tell. Um, I don't necessarily love the set design. Like, the the location they're in feels a bit fake, in my opinion, in a way that none of the other locations in the show have so far. I don't know why. It, I, there's just something about the location and the set that doesn't work for me quite as well as some of the other locations have in the show. Um, it just feels weirdly, weirdly, like, it feels the most like it's just a soundstage in a studio rather than an actual location. Um, but that's fine. I don't think we'll be staying there much longer. Um, the interesting stuff about Aaron Deer's storyline here. First of all, Aaron Deer is uh, becoming a slightly more compelling character. Um, his, his sort of stoicism and quiet determination uh, are not my favorite character archetype, but it is now becoming clear that those are actual 
character traits that they are doing something interesting with, because we see him being the only elf willing to cut down the ancient tree, uh, because he's more sort of practically minded and closer to humanity in a way, in, at least in terms of his outlook, um, than some of his fellow elves. Um, I'm not, by the way, I'm not going to necessarily dwell on the optics of making the first canonically black elf in the visual universe of Lord of the Rings, as far as I know, and then immediately having him be enslaved and put in chains. There's a discussion to be had there. I'm not going to have it right now. Uh, I don't think I'm qualified, and I also haven't had time to see whether this is a thing other people have noticed and find weird about that particular storyline. So, just, I'm noting it as potentially weird that they did that. I don't think it was like a purposefully weird thing. I think it was a case of not really, not really thinking about it, if, if, if that makes sense. Anyway, um, so, the, the, the tree cutting scene was really interesting. What was also interesting to me is that the other two elves who were with him were, of course, his, uh, his, uh, his colleagues. Uh, we had the one guy who was his friend, who was sort of joking with him in, a, in the first episode, and we have his commander. And it's not, as far as I can tell, it's not actually explained how these guys got captured. I'm guessing that we're supposed to just infer they got caught on their way out of the Southlands. And I don't mind that necessarily. I think that's sort of a very efficient storytelling. Because how they got captured doesn't actually matter. There's a bunch of very plausible and straightforward ways that it could have happened. And we don't really need to know which of them it was because, again... It's, it wouldn't exactly be hard to capture two elves traveling across the countryside when you've got a huge band of orcs. Um, so, yeah, that's... I, I, the fact that they died, however, is interesting to me. Because Tolkien's elves are immortal. And one of the, one of the things that this uh, means is that they are far less accustomed, at least in the Third Age, they are far less accustomed to death for their own kind uh, than, other, than other races. Uh, the death of any individual elf, especially the violent, untimely death, which is really the only kind that they ever experience, uh, barring extraordinary circumstances, is kind of a huge deal and, like, experienced as a hugely tragic event by most elves. Uh, much more so than the death of a human by humans, or the death of a dwarf by dwarves. And I suspect that one of two things is happening here, because we don't really see Arondir and the other guy having that extensive of a reaction to their friend's death. They have... the regular reaction you would expect from your friend dying, which is obviously a horrific thing, and they respond quite appropriately for that. But they respond the same way that humans would. And I'm wondering if in future episodes we will see Arondir maybe going through a more prolonged and elaborate grieving process with some grieving rituals or something um, that he just couldn't really afford to go into while he was actively enslaved and trying to free himself. Or, and this could also be interesting, if we will learn that at this point in history, with the war against Morgoth relatively recent, at least by in terms of elvish memory, uh, the elves are actually quite accustomed to death. Uh, and do actually have much more of a human relationship to the concept of death. 
That, I think, might be an interesting thing to explore, especially if we get comparisons with, for example, elves who were born after the war who don't have that relationship. I think that's a, a little bit of what we might be getting with Elrond and Galadriel. I feel like, I'm not sure if Elrond was born after the last war, but I, I'm certainly getting the implication that he didn't fight in it, that he's never really been in a, in, like, in war himself. I could be wrong about that, but I'm wondering if we're going to basically have that kind of be the the difference between Elrond and Galadriel, that she's essentially a combat veteran and he's not. He's never really faced death. Um, I'm, I'm, that's pure speculation, of course. I, I don't know... First of all, I don't know the lore well enough, and secondly, I don't know how much they're sticking to that lore in the first place. Um, it's been a long time since I've read Silmarillion. Uh, and also, they're specifically not adapting Silmarillion, they're adapting the appendices of Lord of the Rings, so... It's a... I have no idea what's gonna happen there. Um... Yeah, but I just wanted to... I just wanted to... Oops, sorry. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to sort of throw out that particular mm. theory. Um... As to what's going on there. Uh, what else happened in that particular scene? Um, that particular storyline? Um... Minor nitpick, the warg looks stupid. Why did the warg look like that? I don't like the warg's eyes. That looked weird. Um, however, at the end of the episode, we get that particular storyline's conclusion, and also the climax of the episode itself, is the semi-reveal, he's still sort of in the shadows, of the leader of the orcs. So first of all, Definitely not Sauron. Obviously. <laughs> There's no way Sauron is just hanging out here in this trench. Um, but I think that's an elf. I think the guy we see at the end is going to turn out to be an elf. And that's going to be really interesting. I am very excited to see where they go with that. Because the idea that there's an elf who is leading the orcs and having them capture and enslave other elves, among other things, is really fascinating because we don't really get a ton of evil elves with Tolkien. We get some in, like, the ancient mythical times, but even then they're not, like, evil evil. Like, elves just don't, don't turn to the dark side. That's just not a thing that happens, as far as I can remember, in... Tolkien's world. Uh, in the same way that you don't get good orcs, you don't get evil elves. And as someone who really hates the idea of, like, essentially evil or essentially good races, I'm really excited to see the exploration of an evil elf. I would also love to see good good orcs, but I don't think we're getting that. I, I, it would be too incompatible, I think, with sort of the fundamental concept of the orcs in Tolkien's world. But evil elves, we can definitely get some of those, and I'm very into that idea. Um, that's about it for the Erendir storyline. Let's talk about Numenor. So I'm not going to get too much into where the Numenor story is heading, because anyone who's familiar with Tolkien lore knows where it's heading, and that's exciting to me. I'm excited to see how they depict a lot of the stuff that's going to go down with Numenor, and I'm also excited to see which parts of it they're legally allowed to depict, because of the difference between the Silmarillion and the appendices. Uh, I... Like I said, it's been so long since I've read this, so I don't actually know, but I'm curious to see what the actual difference is going to be between what was in the Silmarillion and what they're allowed to depict. Um, but the actual Luminor storyline is interesting, and it gives me a chance to talk about something I've, I sort of completely failed to talk about when in my uh, video on the first two episodes, which is... The fact that this particular uh, show seems to be leaning really, really heavily on the idea of elf-human racism, or speciesism, I guess. 
the idea that there is a lot of tension, if not outright hatred and bigotry, between the humans and the elves, which is not something we're really used to seeing. Uh, in the Third Age, there is a lot of tension between elves and dwarves, but elves and humans tend to... Well, the elves sort of look down on the humans a lot, and like they're not super willing to have their children date humans. But that's for very obvious reasons. You don't want your kid to marry someone who's going to die next week, as far as your perception is concerned. Um, so there isn't really like a systemic case, like systemic prejudice the way that we see here. But here we see a lot of it, and it's actually for a very good reason, which is that, oh, especially in the Southlands, which is that a lot of humans sided with Morgoth in the war. And we actually kind of like... We see the interaction of the immortality with the other, with, with, like, the way that the fact that elves are immortal kind of messes with their relationship with other races. We see that with between Elrond and uh, Durin, where Elrond just basically forgot to visit Durin for 20 years, because to an elf, that's nothing. Like, I'm sure there's plenty of close elven friends who don't see each other for centuries at a time. Uh, but obviously for a, for a mortal, that's a huge deal, even for a long-lived mortal like a dwarf. Um, but we see it in a much more sort of dark and oppressive form in the Southlands, where the elves are kind of like, like, they're not necessarily actively oppressing the humans, but they are very much making it clear that they are there to watch over them to make sure the humans don't do anything the elves don't like. Because they don't trust them and they think that they're evil. And this again comes from the immortality, because to the humans, the war with Morgoth was generations ago. But these actual elves who are currently watching over them remember when they, when these humans' ancestors sided with Morgoth. So to them, it's not ancient history, it's recent events. And so the distrust of the humans makes sense there. Now, as for Numenor, I'm less clear what's going on there, because in Numenor we also have a ton of, actually from both sides, uh, sort of animosity. And I know where the Numenor story is heading, but that stuff hasn't actually happened yet. So I'm not sure, like, if this was set after what is going to happen to Numenor, then this two-sided animosity would make total sense. But it, but it, that, but that stuff clearly hasn't happened yet. So. I don't know why there's so much animosity there, and I'm curious to see how it plays out. Obviously, that animosity is being sort of introduced as build-up for the thing that's going to happen with Numenor. Um, but I'm curious to see it, whether we'll find out the root cause of it. Like, is it just the fact that humans essentially feel like they're tired of playing second fiddle to the elves? Which, by the way, would be a totally valid complaint. As we see with Galadriel here, elves are assholes. <laughs> like, Galadriel is just a huge asshole to these people for no reason. She's very disrespectful and, and expects to be treated as a god just because she's, she's an elf. Um, so I totally understand the human's reaction. I'm just curious to see if there's, like, a specific event that happened that sort of turned them against the elves? Because as far as Galadriel knows, there isn't. Like, Galadriel herself seems baffled why Numenor broke off all contact. Uh, by the way, Numenor looks fantastic. It looks way better than most cities in fantasy adaptations I've seen, um, which, you know, to be fair, is, like, almost entirely due to the massive budget. Uh... Stuff like this is where the budget really shines. Um, and I'm guessing we'll be spending a lot of time in Numenor, so they put a lot of effort into that particular location. 
However, in Numenor, two things happen. Well, a lot of things happen, but two things that I really want to talk about. One, we find out that Halbrand is the heir to the throne. He's not not of Numenor, of Southlands. He's, he's very, very explicitly meant to be an Aragorn figure. It's not subtle. They even, like, specifically made him look super like Aragorn, in my opinion. And the first thought I had was, that's incredibly lame. I don't want another Aragorn figure, and I'm also super tired of the long-lost heir to the throne trope. No, I hate it. Put it back. But then I realized what they're going to do with Halbrand, and now I'm on board again. Because, and I'm fairly confident in saying this, I think there's like a 90% chance I'm right about this. What they're going to do with Halbrand is that he's going to become a Nazgul. Maybe the Witch King, maybe just one of the nine, but he is definitely, I think, going to be a Nazgul. Uh, what we've got here is the setup for Aragorn. We, he's basically built up as being essentially the Aragorn of this story, but as time goes on, and especially as the rings enter into the narrative, we are going to see him go the exact opposite direction of Aragorn. And that's a fun direction to take that character. I, I'm, I'm pleased with that particular idea. Of course, anyone who's seen Lord of the Rings will know that he's not the only character we meet in Numenor uh, who is going to go down a perhaps darker path than one might expect from a heroic protagonist. Because we also meet Isildur. And I don't really have many thoughts on Isildur yet. There's too few scenes with him so far. But I do want to just point out one thing that I found just very funny, and I'm not even sure if I like it or if I find it too on the nose, which is that Isildur is introduced with him sort of staring off into the distance and hearing weird whispers of his name and as everything around him grows quiet and he's sort of spacing out, listening to the whispers. And then he gets called back to himself by someone behind him shouting, Isildur! Really loudly. And, like, the sound comes back. And that is so blatantly just the scene from the Lord of the Rings movies, where Isildur is about to throw the rings into the cracks of doom. And then, he ch and then the, the ring whispers to him and he chooses not to. And he turns around to walk away, and then Elrond shouts, Isildur! at him. It just felt like a really blatant and on-the-nose reference to that scene. And I think it was done because they were afraid that people who were just sort of casual fans of the movies won't immediately recognize the name Isildur the way hardcore fans will. And so they felt the need to, like, do this very in-your-face, like, hey, remember this guy? It's that guy from that scene you remember. <laughs> Which, I mean, well played, but also it kind of took me out of the scene because I just laughed out loud when it happened. Maybe for other people it didn't feel as blatant of a reference as it did for me, but for me it was like, what are you doing? Just really in your face. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I I have nothing else to say about Isildur. Um, I do want to say a couple of things that I forgot to... Before I move on to the Harfoots, because I have some weird stuff to go into about the Harfoots that, like I said, I'm sure not everyone will be interested in listening to. I do want to just say two things about the previous two episodes that I basically just forgot to talk about. Uh, first of all, I think Arendir might be Theo's dad. Uh, I think, I think Arendir and Bronwyn have gotten together before. Because Arendir has this line in episode two, I think, where he tells Bronwyn that her touch has been the only kind thing he's experienced or whatever. 
and like, when did that touch happen? We haven't seen the two of you touching that much. What are you talking about? And it's clear that they have like a pre-existing relationship and are awkward around each other. And I think that they're not actually star-crossed lovers who are just meeting for the first time, but they're kind of into each other. I think that they're exes, actually. <laughs> uh, we'll see if I'm right about that. But right now, I think that these two might just be exes who are, go who are still into each other, but who have decided to split up because of the whole species, interspecies tension thing going on in the Southlands. By the way, I'm aware that the Southlands are just future Mordor. That's that's obvious from the map. Um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about in the first two episodes is something I noticed which is really also funny and took me out of the scene both times it happened, which is that both Bronwyn and Halbrand are introduced in these large groups of characters, of minor side characters, the, the humans in the inn, in Bronwyn's case, and the humans on the shipwreck, in Halbrand's case, and in both cases, it is really funny just how much hotter the obvious main character is than every other human character around them. Like, Bronwyn is introduced surrounded by these, like, old, dirty, ugly, scarred, uh, village people who've never washed their faces and then she's like this radiant beauty and Halbrand is also like supermodel hot while being surrounded by these like really bad like in a bad way shipwreck survivors and he just looks so much better than them and it's really unfortunate in my opinion that they made those particular casting decisions because it just it's too... It really breaks the fourth wall, in my opinion, in a way. Like, when you see a scene and you can immediately just go, oh, there's the main character, because they're hotter than everyone else. Um, I wish they hadn't done that. I wish they'd... I wish they'd made these characters fit a bit more aesthetically into their surroundings when we first meet them. Um, but yeah. Uh, th those are the things I wanted to say about the first two episodes. Now, the Harfoots. I have nothing to say about the plot with the Harfoots here, except to say that I'm now, like, 95% sure that the stranger is going to be Gandalf or Radagast. I believe they might not have the rights to the Blue Wizards at all. I'm not sure, but I think that might be the case. Um... And I also think he's obviously not going to be Saruman, because that would be kind of weird. Although that could be an interesting twist. Um, and he's definitely not going to be Sauron. He's too nice and helpful for that, I think. Although, again, that would be a cool twist. But I do think he's probably Gandalf. Like, I feel like they've kind... Like, as the more time goes on with him, the more they kind of make him almost look like Ian McKellen, in my opinion, which is, like, it, it, I don't know if I'm hallucinating that because I'm convinced he's Gandalf or not. Anyway, I am, I don't have any particular opinions about what would be a good answer to the mystery of this guy's identity. I'm fine with him being Gandalf. I'm fine with him being Radagast. I would be very interested in him being Saruman or Sauron, uh, but I think he's probably Gandalf or Radagast. Uh, but I don't really care about the plot with the Harfoots. I mean, I do. It's a fun plot, and I like the characters. I think Nori and Poppy are fun, uh, a fun, a fun sort of odd couple uh, of hobbits or halflings, I guess. What I want to get into here, and what some people might not be very interested in, is anthropology. So I'm, I'm a social scientist. I'm doing a PhD in social sciences and humanities. Uh, my master's degree and bachelor's degree are in sociology. I've taken many anthropology courses. 
this is sort of like a thing I'm super into. And as, as you can, like, I hope so, considering I'm writing a doctorate about it. Um, and I'm specifically writing a doctorate about like a sociocultural analysis of fantasy stories. But what I found super interesting here is the way they've built the Harfoot culture. Uh, now, this could be... I don't know how much Tolkien actually wrote about the Harfoots and their culture. I don't know how much of this is Tolkien's world-building and how much of this is the show's original world-building. But whichever it is, whichever combination of the two that we're getting, the world-building around the Harfoots is really compelling to me. Because... You can tell, you can trace very clearly how different elements of their culture are directly influenced by their material conditions and also how the culture of the hobbits in the Shire in the Third Age that we know is going to sort of naturally evolve out of these elements. And this is important because something that a lot of people ignore a lot of the time is that most, in most cases, culture is going to be somewhat downstream of material conditions. The material conditions in which a society exists are going to very heavily influence the cultural norms and practices that that society is going to develop. And with the Harfoots, we see this in two ways. We see one, the sort of the fact that they are a nomadic people and they uh, they travel around, uh, essentially following the seasons. I think I think it's implied that they are traveling essentially to places that are more bountiful during the current season, or rather the coming season, which means that while their lifestyle carries a lot of risk, as we see in this episode, there's a lot of loss. In their, in, in their lifestyle, and survival is often very hard. Their actual day-to-day -day lives, however, are fairly easy because they are hunter-gatherers, basically. Uh, they, are not, they, they are not farmers. Uh, the thing about hunting-gathering is that while it can be sort of very difficult to maintain and sort of like you're always on the edge of survival with it, it's also, sort of counterintuitively perhaps, a lot more chill than, uh, than agriculture. Once you have a settled lifestyle and agriculture and stuff like that, you get a lot more regular labor. You get a lot more cases of essentially people working all day, people having jobs that they do. Whereas when you have a nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle, uh, you end up with, again, somewhat paradoxically, uh, a fair amount of free time. You end up with entire days or even weeks where you don't necessarily have to do anything because in the previous week you had a huge hunt and that hunt consumed your life for a week but you caught a bunch of stuff and now you've salted the meat and you can eat it for weeks or you found a batch of berries or fruits or whatever, and that's extremely valuable, and, and you can eat that for weeks now. Or at least days. I don't know about weeks, but... Anyway, the point is, there's a lot of downtime invo involved in this lifestyle. And that naturally leads to a fairly developed, uh, fairly developed, essentially, sort of entertainment culture. Uh, and leisure culture, which is something that the hobbits are known for. Like, the hobbits are known for... They're known for partying. They're known for really enjoying feasting and drinking and sort of socializing and games and play and so forth. They're known for that in the Third Age, in the Shire. And we sort of see the inception of that here in the material conditions of their hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Um... The other thing that we see here is that their lifestyle, as I've said, is very precarious and very, very heavily dependent on the group, the collective. Uh, 
individual Harfoots don't survive for long. They are small, they are not particularly physically capable, uh, the world is big and scary, and they need the resources and the protection that comes with existing as a cohesive group. And because they exist on this knife's edge, where they need the group to survive, but the group itself is also precarious, where it could easily, they could easily all die if something goes horribly wrong, like if they get attacked by wolves or whatever, that could be the end of the entire tribe. Uh, and this results in very, very strong incentives for social cohesion and obedience to strict rules. You can't have people stepping out of line in a society like this. And you can't have people not being close to each other. You can't have people creating conflict because cohesion is necessary. Everyone needs to have everyone else's backs. Everyone needs to know that everyone else has their back and everyone needs to know that no one else is going to do something to endanger the entire group. And as a result, you have strict uh, strict enforcement of social cohesion, which we see a lot of in this episode. But funnily enough, the hobbits of the Shire in the Third Age, who are living the exact opposite lifestyle, they are not precarious at all. Their lifestyle is extremely comfortable and stable. They do not have to worry about anything. You see this particular element of the Harfoots carry forward into hobbit culture because the hobbits also have a very strong sense of social cohesion and while they don't kick people out for disobeying social norms the way the harfoots do disobeying social norms is still heavily socially penalized as we see with bilbo getting essentially ostracized by a bunch of people for not even doing anything that in any way affected anyone in the Shire. He just chose a lifestyle that didn't fit into the social norms, and that was enough to completely ostracize him. Uh, and I think we, again, we see the roots of that here in the material conditions of the Harfoots. Uh, now, sorry, rant over. I just wanted to say how much I love the anthropological world building around the Harfoots. I don't even know if it's on purpose, but it, like, while I was watching, all I could think about was, oh, I see how, I see why the Hobbits are the way they are now. It all comes back to these initial, uh, material conditions. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, that's, a. Uh, that's all I really wanted to talk about here, and I don't really have anything else to say about the episode as a whole, either. Uh, I've talked about everything now. So, um, yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward a lot to the future of this show, and I will be talking to you about episode four uh, right around this time next week, hopefully. See you around.